I'm extremely sorry that I um, can't be at the Giuseppe Cunlan, um Centre for Sunday. I'm extremely sorry to not show how important I thought it was to have a meeting on this subject of the conditions that Bradley Manning is held in in America. It, it is a, a subject that I have thought about and researched for a long time, not because of Bradley Manning, but what has happened to him, in fact, is what happens to a huge number of individuals in the United States who were held in prison in conditions of extreme solitary confinement. And so it is important that there is as big a campaign as there can be about Bradley Manning. It's incredibly impressive how many people are coming forward to say the conditions he's held in are utterly intolerable, which indeed they are. But it will be a, a tragic waste of a process of learning on the part of the wider world not to appreciate that this is how America deals with its prisoners. And it's simply because of the extraordinary circumstances of Mr. Manning's arrest and detention that have provoked public interest. Mm -hmm. At this um, very moment, the European Court of Human Rights is considering a particular proposition. And the question that it has posed to the United Kingdom government is this. If you extradite men to the United States who will be imprisoned in a supermax prison, does the protection of the Eighth Amendment of the US Constitution offer the same protection as Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights? Now, this question is important. Article 3 of the European Convention prohibits torture or inhuman and degrading treatment. Keeping people in total isolation for enormous periods of time, in the case of many prisoners in America, for the whole of their lives without parole, constitutes torture, constitutes inhuman and degrading treatment. And this is something not just said by campaigners or families of people detained, it's said by the UN um, rapporteur on torture by the Council of Europe and by the European Court in other cases. America, on the other hand, in cases that deal with the Eighth Amendment, has said it's a human right, an inalienable human right, to have warmth and shelter, but it isn't a right guaranteed by the Eighth Amendment to have human company. I knew it was going to keep going. Yeah. The deprivation of any individual in the company of his fellow man or woman is not simply the grimness of isolation, the grimness of being only with your own thoughts for all time. It actually has severe psychological effects, irreparable damage it causes to the individual and more surprisingly perhaps physical damage too to the brain. And so the infliction of solitary confinement on any individual is certainly on the cusp if it is prolonged of torture. There is another aspect to this, which is, what's the purpose of this? Is it punishment before the individual has been ever tried and convicted? Or is it something else? And this is the other aspect of the why and wherefore of how America deals with its criminal justice system. 97% 
of people facing trial in America plead guilty. That's an extraordinary statistic. Why do they do it? They do it in large part because by pleading guilty you have a chance of negotiating and escaping the worst of the sentences that face you. If you face trial in America but agree to become a cooperating witness, you have another chance of escaping what would otherwise be a pretty brutal fate in terms of the years you might spend serving a sentence. Is this what's happening to Bradley Manning? Is he under this kind of duress, this form of punitive isolation in the hope that he might become a cooperating witness against Julian Assange and thereby pave the way for an extradition request which otherwise might not be possible. Is this what it's all about? We don't know and that's why it is of great importance and of profound interest from this country observing as we do how others deal with prisoners to realise the interplay of international push-me-pull-you attempts to obtain evidence and to identify how cases can be progressed not openly, not straightforwardly but by a back door. Now in this country we find it easy to condemn how others in other countries treat their prisoners. We find it easy to say we are horrified how the death penalty still exists in America. We find it easy to say we're horrified by the continuing atrocity that is Guantanamo. But nevertheless, when you dig, you find how complicit we have been here in the perpetuation of practices, how we, our ministers, our civil servants, our intelligence agencies, combined and were completely complicit in the unlawful removal to Guantanamo of British citizens and British residents. There has enough been disclosed, shockingly, to make that course of events crystal clear. But what's happened in the case of Bradley Manning and WikiLeaks is ironic because it's come full circle. It was a liberation of information so that the world could know. The world hasn't come to an end because of the information that was liberated. It's been instructive. It has not, in, if, in fact, um, led to the United States and the revelations of its diplomats being thought of worse in the world. In fact, um, it has revealed perhaps rather more perception and honesty than those diplomats were given credit for in the past in their observations of the countries and the regimes in which they were placed. But in turn, those who liberated that information and have faced the music for what they did have themselves become the repository of more secret abuse, this time applied not to others but to themselves. And so it's a curious irony that in trying to unravel precisely what is happening to Bradley Manning in isolation, under duress, being coerced, one is having to dig deep again into the secrets of the state, the secrets of the US and the way it deals with its prisoners. 
And in that, there has been so extraordinary a campaign now, which has required our Foreign Office, which has required ministers to take up the cause of a man with a Welsh mother. Insofar as that demand has been made and is being pursued, insofar as it has woken up a hundred law professors in the United States to write an open letter in the New York Times and say they regard the treatment of Bradley Manning as violating all of the guarantees of the US Constitution. Insofar as it is provoking that degree of public knowledge, then ironically it's forming a public service in itself. I find it um, symbolically appropriate that this meeting is being held at the Giuseppe Conlon Centre. He and his son Jerry spent years in English prisons, quite wrongly, treated in a way that violated all of their rights. Jerry Conlon certainly spent years in solitary confinement, protesting his innocence and being abused for doing so. But the echoes of one wrong situation continue and haunt others. And we can see in Bradley Manning's situation now a litany of years of protest, revelation, punishment, more protest, more revelation. We don't learn from our mistakes in the past. We perpetuate them. But if this causes an end to some of the worst of the mistakes in the way prisoners are regarded in America, treated and forgotten, then it's important to mark that and note it.